Good morning, and welcome to Santee United Methodist Church's online worship service. Uh, whether Wherever it is you find yourself, wherever it is you come together with us, whether you're in your pajamas, whether you're in your kitchen, whether you're in your backyard, uh, we're so glad that you came to be together with us today. It's a little weird, I have to say, uh, welcoming you when this is my first Sunday together with you. Uh, I'm sure most of you have been here much longer than I have, and I'm welcoming you to, uh, welcoming you to worship. Uh, but I do want to say thank you so much for the welcome that you have extended to me and Carmen and our daughter Scarlett, and for all of the amazing ways that we already feel like we're a part of this community. Uh, we are so excited uh, to be here. We're so excited to be a part of this worship, to be a part of what God is doing in this place and in with this people. And we look forward to doing that not just today, but for many years to come. Uh, so now let us begin with our worship. We now come to a time in our worship service where we celebrate and embrace as a body the appointment of our new pastor. Please join in hearing and sharing these words of welcome and affirmation. Dear friends, today we welcome Pastor Jamie Pangman, who has been appointed to serve as our pastor. We believe that he is well qualified and has been prayerfully appointed by Bishop Grant Agaya. Pastor Jamie, you have been sent to live among us as a bearer of the word of God, a minister of the sacraments, and a sustainer of the love, order, service, and discipleship of the people of God. Today, I reaffirm this commitment to all of those present from this congregation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as a people committed to participate in the ministries of the church, by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service, will you who celebrate this new beginning support and uphold Pastor Jamie in these ministries Please respond as a congregation. We reaffirm our commitment to support you with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, service, and witness. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger. Who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation. Let us pray. Eternal God, strengthen and sustain us in our ministries together with Jamie Pangman as our pastor. 
give him and us patience, courage, and wisdom, so to care for one another and challenge one another, that together we may follow Jesus Christ, living together in love and offering our spiritual gifts and talents in your service. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. At this point in the litany, representatives of the congregation would traditionally make presentations of gifts that are symbolic of our new Christian relationship and the promise of this next chapter in the life of Santee UMC. Given that these unprecedented times require flexibility and creativity in honoring our traditions and celebrations, some of the gifts we offer you and your family, Pastor Jamie, may be delayed until once again we can be physically present in fellowship. Pastor Jamie, to nourish your bodies, members of the congregation will be providing welcome meals during the month of July. You will come to find that your new flock contains many talented cooks. Amen. Pastor Jamie, when circumstances permit it, you will be presented with a Methodist hymnal engraved with your name and in which members and friends of this congregation have indicated their favorite hymn by signing the page on which it is located. Amen. Pastor Jamie, once a design has been selected and approved, we will present you with a new stole that signifies your ordination as we ask you to guide us in the word and to share God's grace, love, and forgiveness through the sacraments. Amen. Pastor Jamie, together we share this blessing with you. I invite those of you who are listening to raise your hand as you join in these words of blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Amen.
One of my favorite things to do uh, in worship is at the beginning of every month in the Methodist Church, we get to take part in a wonderful meal uh, called Communion, uh, a meal that uh, is set and prepared for us by Christ, Jesus Christ. Uh, and it's one that all people can take part in. In the United Methodist Church, we believe that uh, you don't have to have done anything special, just as you don't have to do anything special to uh, be a part of the love of God. And so if you want to take part with us today, I urge you to uh, find some uh, juice of some kind and find some um, a piece of bread. Uh, as I'm in the process of transitioning, it's really going to be a an interesting uh, experience for me with a piece of bread and a little bit of juice that I have available. Uh, but I hope that you will join me in this meal um, as we uh, can't do it together, but we will do it knowing that there are people around us that are doing taking part in it uh, all over the, the city and across the world and across the country. Uh, and this meal uh, brings us together in Jesus Christ. Um, we will begin by confessing our sins. Christ, our Lord, invites to this table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and who seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right, and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us who take part in this meal and on these gifts of bread and wine. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us say the prayer that he taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Amen. And now we share this meal together. Um, if you would, I'm going to, uh, if you have people with you, then I would like you to share it to the person um, that's sitting next to you and say, First, with the bread, this is the body of Christ given for you. Um, and then take the cup and say, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Um, and then respond, I'm going to do it with my wife right here, uh, right now. And then if you're by yourself at the end, I will uh, do it directly to you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. This is the blood of Christ, shed for you. Thanks be to God. morning. My name is Lee Wilson. This morning I'm reading from the Hebrew Bible from Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 to 6 and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. This is God's commission to Joshua. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and the Lebanon as far as the great river, 
the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea in the west shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. God bless you all. Amen. I want to start today's message by giving thanks. First, by giving thanks to God for giving us this wonderful opportunity to stand and be with you today, for calling me to ministry in the first place and reaffirming it in my life. Second, I want to th give thanks to you. Uh, I want to give you thanks for inviting me to join you in worship, uh, for giving this pastor from half a world away a chance to come and preach in front of you in San Diego. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity it is, and I'm so, so grateful for it. Uh, I just want you to know that it is an honor and a blessing um, to be with you this morning. I can tell you when I first felt called to ministry, I did not know I would end up in a place like this. Uh, I'm fairly sure God must have gotten some of the wires crossed. Who was I to be a pastor? Uh, surely some great leader in some far-off place uh, would have been a much better fit than me. I, I might have had similar thoughts when I found out that God and the United Methodist Church was going to send me to California as well. Uh, more than once in the past few months, I felt a little like Abraham being caught out of his homeland and called to go to a far-off land that he had never seen before, trusting that God would be involved in everything that happened to him. But there's something amazing about the fact that God doesn't call the people that we think ought to be called. God doesn't call the most powerful people, or the most connected, or the most charismatic. God calls me. God calls you. God calls the people who don't believe themselves worthy to, the ta to, be, to do the tasks that he calls them to, and then God gives them what they need. Uh, over and over in the Bible, we read stories about people who thought they weren't worthy, and we look back on them now and think about how great they were, but when they were called, they weren't great. When they were called, they were normal. They were less than normal in some cases. Um, Jesus started his ministry not by calling the priests and the Pharisees, the most learned, the ones that knew the Bible the best. He didn't call the leaders of Palestine and Rome, the most powerful people who could get everything done that Jesus wanted to get done. He started by calling fishermen and common folk. In the story we read today, we're going to hear about how God called on the unprepared. And for me, all of those stories are wonderful sources of hope. Okay, it wasn't at first, I'll admit. When I realized God was expecting me to preach every Sunday, uh, my first inclination as an introverted person was to think, yeah, you got the wrong guy, God. But it has come to be something Wonderful. First, that God knows us better than we know ourselves sometimes. But second, that it means that we are all special, that we are all useful, that God knows that we are all worthy. A word that uh, we used to use in the first church that I ever uh, was the pastor of was the idea that every person is a cog pow, a C O G. P-O-W, which stands for a child of God and a person of worth. We all, all of us, I don't care who you are and what you're doing and where you're listening to me today, you have worth. And in a way, we're celebrating that this Sunday more than any other, uh, that special truth that every person has worth. After all, uh, that truth is the one that our forefathers were willing to sacrifice everything for. For it was 244 years ago 
on a hot and stuffy 4th of July, when a group of men put their signatures to a piece of paper that would send shockwaves throughout the world, that would just start a revolution, a rebellion, that would upend centuries of an established order, would fight back against the assumed notion that the system of government that was the only one that would work was a tyrannical monarchy and would bring about freedom and hope for millions of people around the world. Of course, we all know this piece of paper as the Declaration of Independence. And for the men who signed it on that first 4th of July, it was a momentous occasion, not just because they knew the power of the words to the things that they were signing, but because by adding their names to it, they knew they were getting ready to make a huge sacrifice. Over the course of the next few years, thousands of people would die in what became known as the Revolutionary War. The country that they declared their independence from was not just going to let their most profitable colonies go away without a fight. They were going to try their best to keep them. And the most wanted people would be the ones who signed that document that started it all. Most of the signers ended up losing sons, property, family, losing stature and influence. They lost friends and relatives who believed that what they had done made them traitors and vile rebels. And in a few cases, the signers lost their lives. But if you were to ask them, I would imagine that most, if not all of them, would have, would have if they had been given the chance to reevaluate their choices, would have still made the same one. Because the reasons behind all of their efforts were more important than even their lives. They signed to free themselves from an oppressive government. They signed to bring about the ideals of liberty to a world that had forgotten what liberty really was. And most importantly, at least to me, they did it to remind themselves and the world that we have sacred worth. As their declaration states, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, you see, King George didn't believe those truths were self-evident at all. Most of the world at that time didn't believe that those rights were self-evident. To him and to the world, all people were really subjects of the realm. They were owned by the state and therefore by him. They didn't have any sacred worth beyond the worth that the king granted to them. But I think that those signers understood something more powerful, more true, that through God all people have sacred worth, and that their worth was given to them not because they did something special, but because God gave it to them freely. He had imbued all of creation and all of the people in it with unalienable rights that could not be taken away by any king or worldly authority, that they and we are simply loved because we are. And you'll hear me say, I'm sure, many times over, we and they are cog pals, children of God, people of worth. That, to me, is the beautiful idea that we celebrate every 4th of July. On some level, I believe that it is something that is born out in Christ's message and his sacrifice for us. That said that Christ was willing to come and die to show us that he loved us. That he loves us. And that nothing we can do will make God forsake us. That is an idea worth fighting for. I thank God for all of those who have fought and died to keep those ideals alive. Those original signers understood that and were willing to risk everything, even up to death itself, to keep that idea alive. And it's an idea that continues to have to be fought for. 
In many ways, we have seen that played out on our television screens and perhaps in person across the country in the past couple of months, as people have to reassert their unalienable worth to a world that is forgotten, that our worth doesn't come from what we do. It comes from who we are and whose we are. It's an idea that will always require us to leave our comfort zones like the signers did to stand up for what's right, even when the whole world tries to convince us that we're wrong. But it's worth doing. I truly believe that the idea of God's sacred worth is one worth dying for. And every so often it is important to remind ourselves of the sacrifices that living for Jesus Christ entails. After all, Jesus didn't say that if we followed him we would have a nice easy life. He said we would have a cross, and we'd have to take up our cross to follow him. Now believe me, I know that as I sit before you today online, uh, every person watching this um, feels that something's happening, something different, that we stand on the cusp of great changes. And at least right now, I don't just mean in our world. This is my first Sunday here with you. You've had to say goodbye to Pastor Christian, who has been with you for five years. And unlike the signers of the Declaration of Independence, you might not have signed up for getting a new pastor in the midst of all of these crazy things going on. I mean, in a way we did, because we all signed up to be Methodists instead of some other denomination where you get to have a pastor for 40 years. This is how it works. But it's always hard to say goodbye. And one of the situations that makes being a Methodist perhaps hard, great change and transition gets thrust upon us over and over in the course of our lives as Christians. And I don't know about you, but these transitions are always hard. They can be fun, don't get me wrong. They can be exciting. Because if there's any truth, one truth out there, what I've known by moving around so much is that there are good and wonderful people to be met everywhere you go. But it's always hard. It always requires us to give up what we know and what we love. Indeed, that's always been the paradox of being a Christian in general, and a Methodist in particular, because... If we live into God's greatest commandment to love God and do that by loving other people, then when we do it well, at some point, we will be filled with grief when we have to say goodbye. To love someone and then to say goodbye is always hard. There's a temptation when that happens over and over and over again to get discouraged, to let the changes affect us, or make us unwilling to move forward. And yet that is exactly what God calls us to do, which is why I wanted to talk today about uh, this passage from the beginning of the book of Joshua. Because the truth is, we find ourselves in a situation very similar to the one that Joshua and the Israelites found themselves in. As verse 1 of the first chapter of Joshua points out, the Israelites were faced with a deeply profound change to the way that things worked for them. For 40 years, they had known one ruler, one leader, Moses. He wasn't just a leader, though. Moses had been their spiritual guide, their moral compass, their connection with God. After all, Moses had been handpicked by God in a burning bush to deliver the people of Israel out of Egypt and out of slavery. He performed miracles. He overwhelmed the Pharaoh, he, the most powerful man of, in the world at the time, and led the Israelites out of Egypt. He guided them through the desert for 40 long years, corrected them when they strayed from God, even intervened on their behalf when God wanted to threaten, threaten to destroy them and had continuously been the one to keep giving them hope, to say, come on, we can do this. Through all of the trials and all of the tribulations, he kept reminding them that at the end of the road there was a land flowing with milk and honey. 
that this desert would not last forever. And now 40 years after all of those things, that land wasn't a dream anymore. It was right in front of them. It was right on the other side of the Jordan River. They could see it. And yet, there were already people living in it. Which meant that there were even greater challenges than the desert that stood before them. And now, what are we going to do? What's next? Well, Moses, what do we need to do? We still have him, right? He had never failed them up to that point. But now Moses was dead. Just as they finally saw the light at the end of this 40-year-long tunnel, just as they were on the banks of the Jordan, just as they finally, finally prepared to claim the promise God had given them through Moses, he up and dies. And to top it off, they were left with some replacement leader, some young assistant to Moses named Joshua. You see the parallels? Just a few of them. Now, Pastor Christian has been a central part of this community for five years, and in that time he has led you through good times and bad times, counseled you and your families, helped guide this church to great new ministries and overseen the beginning of great new things God is doing in your midst, and through it all... He came to earn your trust and your respect. And now in the middle of the journey, because we're Methodists, he's moving on. And the work's not even done yet. Right when you could maybe see the end, light at the end of the tunnel, and now they plop this new pastor and his family in your midst from Alabama, of all places. And I know that brings both excitement and worry, since you don't know what to expect from me yet, and yet, I think that I appreciate that this is the way God works. Because as I started this sermon, it is how God reminds us that we all have a part to play. That we can't come to rely on someone else to do the work for us, even a pastor, to be the agent of change and love in our midst, when God is calling all of us to be a part of what he is doing. That doesn't mean that I don't also understand this transition is going to take time. That we're entering a time of mourning and loss for what was, a time to cope with Pastor Christian's departure from this place, and a time to get to know and trust me as well. And to do it all while we're not even able to meet in person because of coronavirus, all while social upheaval and economic uncertainty and changing landscapes in our culture seem to be taking place. Honestly, um, I've read this passage a lot, and I've thought about this a lot, especially every time I've come through a transition, but this is one of the first times that I think that we might give Joshua and the Israelites a run for their money for hard, difficult tasks. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. But it's something that I'm dedicated to spending, I hope you are, as well. And yet I also know that in the midst of all of this, God is still calling on us to keep moving forward. At times, the way that God does it might even seem harsh. I mean, look again at verse 2. Uh, when God addresses Joshua for the first time, he says, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed across the Jordan. I guess they were lucky God added a period between those two sentences, and yet it points to the difficult position the Israelites found themselves in on that Jordan River. I'm sure they would have appreciated the chance to spend a long time mourning the loss of Moses. But there was still, still so much to be done, and the longer they stood on that Jordan River, the longer the people across the river had to prepare for their coming. And so they couldn't just stand and mourn. They had to move forward and mourn. Therefore, God reminds them in verse 2 that this is no time to let up. It's no time to forget the task at hand. In fact, it's time to step up their efforts. And that's true of us here in Santee as well. For our call from Jesus to go forth and make disciples to the entire world is one that will take as long or as short as we want to make it. 
and it is no less daunting of a task than the ones that the Israelites faced, but that doesn't mean we're starting blind either. Much like the Israelites who had learned and listened to God through Moses for 40 years, so too are we ready to face these trials with all that Pastor Christian prepared us for. We're not flying blind, but we are on a path that God has prepared, and God is taking it with us. I understand that uh, Santee United Methodist has adopted a vision through which God is guiding us uh, to be better Christians and a better community. Um, it says, to be a community of Christ that reaches out, accepts all people, and transforms lives. That you want to be a church with a purpose, not a church with programs. And that every... I've also heard of the many great ministries and opportunities through which God is reaching out into the community and beyond, and God is using the people and the ministries here to accomplish those goals, to make disciples of the world, to help all people come to know they are worthy, worthy of love, worthy of belonging, worthy of dignity, cog pals. Because through Christ, that is what we know to be true. And similar to them, God comes to us now with a daunting message. Just as he said to them, uh, your servant Moses is dead, now go across the Jordan. He says to us, Pastor Christian is moving to La Mesa. Now continue to move, make disciples of Jesus Christ, that together we might change the world. The only concern one shared by God in this passage is that if we get too preoccupied on the struggles of transition, we might lose the more important focus that God's working in our midst. And believe me when I say that I understand it's much easier to say this than it is uh, to actually live it out. I've lived through a lot of transitions like this in my life, growing up a military brat, becoming a pastor, and while it's not always bad, it's never easy. But here's the greatest news of all. No matter what happens, we are promised we don't take this path by ourselves. For after giving the Israelites an extremely difficult task and calling on them to move to the next phase of their journey, perhaps before they were ready to do it, he then says, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you, and I will not forsake you. So be strong and courageous, for you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give to them. And that is the glorious good truth. God goes with us, no matter what. So there's nothing we have to be afraid of. For if we tr stay true to the God and Savior whom we serve, if we stay true to the work of loving God by loving our neighbors, and if we continue with all that we have to make disciples of all the nations, then I know that God will be there with us when we see his kingdom brought to earth. I know that God will bless us and God will do it abundantly. So let us, as we continue and begin this work together, let us stay true to the mission God has given us and let us do it together in love. I look forward to it. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, you are present with us today and every day. We seek to stay close to you and see you in everything we see, say, or do. God, we pray for our country in this time of challenge and change. Give us the wisdom to honor our fellow citizens through our actions and our words. We continue to lift up those in medical professions, law enforcement, and government who are working so hard to heal us, protect us, and guide us. God, we pray for our community. Bind us together in a spirit of understanding and acceptance of each other. 
Give us loving hearts to build a better community for all our citizens. God, we pray for our congregation, for those who are sick, bring courage and healing. For those who are depressed in their isolation, bring them peace and connection. For those who are mourning the loss of someone dear to them, we pray for your love to surround them and console them. For those of us struggling in this time of so many changes, we look to your constant presence and love. God, we pray for Pastor Jamie. Bless him as he begins his ministry here at SUMC. Bless his family as they deal with the challenges of moving, settling in, and learning about their new home. Let us be good neighbors and helpful congregants, doing what we can to be welcoming and caring. God bless us as we move through transition. Let us be strong and courageous as we work to build a compassionate church, a closer community, and a loving world. Amen. forth into this day and into this week, I want to leave you one more time with the words from Joshua, uh, the words of God that come from Joshua, as he says, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you and I will not forsake you, so be strong and courageous. Amen. Amen.